Good morning. My name is Dan Scripps, Chair of the Michigan Public Service Commission, and I call this meeting of the Commission to order on July 23rd, 2024 at 10.03 a.m. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chair Scripps? Present. Commissioner Paratic. Present. Commissioner Carrion? Present. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today's meeting is being held in person at the Commission's office here at 7109 West Saginaw Highway in Lansing, Michigan. We are also hosting this meeting remotely using Microsoft Teams. Telephone relay service is available through the phone option. If you are participating via Microsoft Teams, you may also turn on the live captions by clicking on the More button at the top right of your Teams window, then clicking on Language and Speech from the drop-down menu, and finally clicking on Turn on Live Captions. As indicated in the notice for today's meeting, if we lose the remote connection, the Commission will not recess. The meeting will be recorded and available for future reference on the Commission's website. In addition, the Commissioners can receive comments via MPSC, or, sorry, via lara-mpsc-commissioners2 at michigan.gov, lara-mpsc-commissioners2 at michigan.gov. And for reference, this email is also included in today's meeting notice. We will have an opportunity for the public to make comments as provided in the agenda. Few notes about this. Uh, comments are limited to one per person and three minutes a person. If you would like to make verbal comments, you must do so in person or remotely through Microsoft Teams or by calling into the meeting by phone. For individuals attending in person and who want to make a verbal comment, please fill out a comment card. They are available at the, uh, at the front table near the podium, uh, and they look like this. We have a couple uh, already. Um, for individuals participating remotely by Microsoft Teams and who want to make a verbal comment, you may click on the raise hand button at any time to be queued up for comment. For individuals participating remotely by phone and who want to make a verbal comment, you may press star five at any time to be queued up for comment. Note that public commenters on both Microsoft Teams and on the phone are added to the same speaker queue and will be called upon in the order they enter the speaker queue. So please do not lower your hand or press star five again or you will be removed from the queue and lose your place in line. And finally, to minimize disruptions, attendees participating by Microsoft Teams or by phone will be muted until we reach the time for public comment. The first order of business is approval of the agenda for today's meeting. I move for the approval of the agenda for today's commission meeting. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve today's agenda. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The agenda is approved. The next item of business on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the July 2, 2024 commission meeting. I move for the approval of the minutes from the July 2, 2024 commission meeting. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the minutes from the July 2, 2024 commission meeting. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The commission meeting minutes of July 2, 2024 are approved. The next item of business on the agenda is the approval of orders and minute actions on the consent agenda, and today the Commission is assisted by Staff Attorney Alyssa Day. I recognize Ms. Day. Good morning. Good morning. Today's consent agenda consists of five communications matters, 11 electric matters, and one gas matter. The proposed orders and minute actions for these matters have been thoroughly vetted by the Commission's technical and legal staff and are ready for your approval. Thank you, Ms. Day. I move for the approval of the orders and minute actions on the consent agenda. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the orders and minute actions on the consent agenda. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The orders and minute actions on the consent agenda are approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A1 is case number U17377, which involves implementation of the provisions of Public Act 95 of 2013. The order before you adopts the funding factor for the Low Income Energy Assistance Fund for 2024 through 2025. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-17377. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-17377 is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A2 is case number U17473, which involves a request filed by Consumers Energy Company for approval of the company's 2024 annual true-up adjustment to the current securitization charges in conformity with the December 6, 2013 order in this docket. The order before you approves the request and accepts Consumers Energy Company's 2024 annual true-up adjustment. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-17473. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? 
We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-17473 is approved. Recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A3 is case number U-20496, which involves an application by Consumers Energy Company requesting ex parte approval of a power purchase agreement amendment. The order before you grants National Energy of Lincoln LLC's request to withdraw its petition for rehearing. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-20496. I second. Oops. Oh, I second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any discussion? <laughs> Jump in the gut here. Uh, we will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-20496 is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Items 4A4, 4A5, and 4A6 are case numbers U21543, U21481, and U21569 et al respectively. Case number U21543 involves a matter on the commission's own motion to approve a standard agreement for use with level one, two, and three interconnections. Case number U21481 involves the approval of interconnection procedures for the member regulated electric cooperatives. Case numbers U21569 et al involve a matter on the commission's own motion to one, opening dockets for the purpose of receiving comments on issues related to Public Act 235 of 2023, two, providing guidance on the act, three, granting a waiver from certain provisions of the interconnection and distributed generation standards, and four, directing affected utilities to file revised distributed generation tariffs in new dockets. Staff member Cody Matthews will describe these orders. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Cody Matthews. I work in the Interconnection and Distributed Energy Resources section. I will be discussing three orders today that relate to the approval of the Michigan Electric Cooperative Association, the MECA Co-ops, interconnection procedures, approval of a standard level one, two, and three interconnection agreement, and the commission's findings related to sections 173 and 177 and related definitions of Public Act 235 of 2023. On April 25, 2023, the Michigan Interconnection and Distributed Generation Standards, the Mixed DG Rules, became effective. The Mixed DG Rules require each electric utility to develop a set of interconnection procedures and file them for commission review. Subsequent to a working session with staff and interested per persons on August 23, 2023, the MECA Co-ops filed an application in case number U-21481 et al seeking approval of final proposed mixed DG procedures and requesting four rule waivers. The first waiver requested is related to rule 26.3 A, C, and D, which address maximum fees for system impact and facility studies. The order approves the request and grants a two-year waiver for the increased fees. The second waiver request pertains to rule 32.2, which provides an authority to electric utilities to limit the number of pre-application report requests filed during a one-week period to 10 requests per applicant and its affiliates. The order approves a two-year waiver for the MECA co-op's request to reduce the number to two pre-applications per one-week period. The third waiver request is related to Rule 8, which provides an additional 10 business days to comply with the timelines in the mixed DG rules for electric co-op electric utilities with fewer than 1 million in-state customers. While the MECA co-ops did not request a specific increase in the number of business days, the order approves a two-year waiver allowing the MECA co-ops an additional 25 business days. The fourth request involves a waiver from Rule 56, which allows an electric utility to use a process to study interconnection applications that is different from the process described by R460.954 and R460.958-262. However, this alternative process is not currently included in the MECA Co-op's proposed interconnection procedures as required by Rule 56, and the Commission declined to approve the waiver request. 
The order finds that the MECA co-op shall utilize the standard level one, two, and three interconnection agreement approved today in the July 23, 2024 order in case number U-21543, which I'll describe next, and the standard level four and five interconnection agreement attached to the staff's May 22, 2024 comments and agreed to by the MECA co-ops in reply comments. The order finds that the MECA co-ops should file interconnection procedures and forms in this docket consistent with the findings in this order within 30 days of the date of this order. As noted previously, the second order to be issued today in case number U-21543 concerns the approval of a standard level one, two, and three interconnection agreement Rule 1BJJ requires that electric utilities use a statewide standard interconnection agreement for all level one, two, and three interconnection projects. In the U-21543 order issued on February 8, 2024, the commission sought comments and reply comments on a proposed level one, two, and three interconnection agreement for projects up to 550 kilowatts. Among the proposed revisions adopted by the Commission are those concerning insurance and limiting the applicability of the agreements to certified DERs. Several commenters proposed changes to the indemnity provisions in this agreement. However, the Commission declined to adopt those comments. The third order to be issued today in case number U-21569 et al. implements the provisions of sections 173 and 177 and related definitions of Public Act 235 of 2023 and grants waivers from certain interconnection and distributed generation standards which are not in alignment with Public Act 235. The U-21569 order sought comments on three aspects of the statutory changes resulting from Act 235, generation meters, distributed generation bill credits, and the generator size limit. Commenters raised several issues about generation meters. The order acknowledges that there is no need for a generation meter to collect billing determinant information. The order finds that there is no requirement for the use of a generation meter for certified projects under 150 kilowatts in size, and that electric utilities should be allowed to make a determination as to the need for a generation meter on a case-by-case -case basis for certified projects larger than 150 kilowatts and for non-certified projects larger than 20 kilowatts, and further finds that the regulatory mandates in the mixed DG rules for generation meters are in conflict with MCL 460.1177 and grants the necessary waivers. Concerning the amended bill credit language, all commenters were in agreement that the new provisions eliminate the restrictions that credits may only be used for power supply charges, and the statute now limits the use of credits to the total bill. The order agrees with the commenters and further finds that the outflow credits may not be used to offset securitization charges appearing on the customer's bill. Regarding generator size limits, some commenters described the upper limit of generator size as 550 kilowatts, and others described the upper limit as 110% of the customer's electric consumption for the previous 12 months. The order finds that the size of the renewable energy system eligible for the DG program is limited to 110% limited to of the customer's electricity consumption for the previous 12 months, and the aggregate eligible generator capacity at a single site is limited to no more than 550 kilowatts. The order grants a waiver for the definition of an eligible electric generator contained in R460.901AY. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21543. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? Yes, thanks, Chair. I'd like to, first of all, thank the fantastic staff here at the MPSC who have been working on these interconnection and distributed generation issues for the past few years. It's been a lot of work to revise these rules and then adjust to meet the changes made by the new clean energy laws that were passed by the legislature and signed by Governor Whitmer last year. These new laws allow, uh, sorry, these new laws now require an allowance for the 10 times of the previous capacity of distributed solar generation in our state and made other modifications to making installing rooftop solar panels easier and cheaper for homeowners. As described by Mr. Matthews, the orders before us right now provide guidance to utilities and customers for how to connect distributed energy generation and storage 
directs new distributed generation tariffs to be filed to be consistent with the new energy laws and approves standard interconnection agreements for projects up to 550 kilowatts to simplify and to streamline the process. I'm excited about the progress that we're making in the state of Michigan in expanding distributed solar generation and home energy storage solutions. We now have almost 20,000 customers in Michigan with distributed solar on their properties. That increased over 8% year over year, according to our status of renewable energy distributed generation and legacy net metering report for 2023. And I'm very thankful for our staff, like Mr. Matthews and the whole team he worked with, who've been able to effectively implement these changing parameters from the legislature, changing planning and implementation from the utilities, and changing preferences from customers. Thank you, Commissioner Peretic. Is there any additional discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21543 is approved. I, I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21481. I second the motion. Is there any discussion on this one? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21481 is also approved. And finally, I move for the approval of the order in case number numbers U-21569 at all. I second the motion. Is there any discussion here? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number is U-21569 at all is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A7 is case number U-21488, which involves an application filed by Alpena Power Company for authority to increase its rates for the sale of electricity. The order before you approves an amended settlement agreement resolving all issues in the case. According to key provisions of the amended settlement agreement, the company's tariffs shall be revised to reflect an annual revenue increase of approximately 2.5 million, effective for service on and after the date of this order. The authorized rate of return on common equity is 9.85%, and the overall rate of return is 6.29%. The amended settlement agreement also includes a subsequent rate increase moratorium with no new general rate increase prior to January 1st, 2026. Thank you, Ms. Day. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21488. I second the motion. Just before we vote on this one, a, a couple notes. Uh, in addition to the uh, core elements that Ms. Day provided, uh, the settlement agreement that was agreed to by the company, our, our commission staff, and the attorney general also includes a number of additional provisions, including uh, modifying the company's distributed generation tariff to be consistent with the provisions of Public Act 235 of 2023. Um, extending the company's electric vehicle charging pilot through the end of 2028, and revising the time of use provisions uh, and the on-peak to off-peak ratios in a series of tariffs, including the company's efficient electric heat tariff, a uh, pair of electric vehicle charging tariffs, and then tariffs for large power and large industrial customers. So just want to express my thanks to, to the company, the staff, and the attorney general uh, for working together on what I think is a, a constructive settlement uh, in this case and uh, pleased to see the order in front of us. Is there any additional discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21488 is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A8 is case number U-21586, which involves an application filed by Upper Peninsula Power Company for waivers of certain provisions of the Commission's service quality and reliability standards for electric distribution systems. The order before you dismisses the application at the request of the utility and closes the docket in the proceeding. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21586. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21586 is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4A9 is case number U-21768, which concerns the commencement of a rulemaking proceeding to amend the uniform system of accounts for major and non-major electric utilities, MISH admin code R460.9002, and R460.9003. The order before you sets a public hearing regarding adoption of rules and establishes a period for interested persons to provide comments. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21768. I second the motion. 
Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21768 is approved. I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4B1 is case number U-21490, which involves an application filed by Consumers Energy Company requesting authority to increase its rates for the distribution of natural gas and other relief. The order before you approves a settlement agreement that resolves all issues in the case. Staff member Tim Witt will describe this order. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Tim Witt, and I'm an auditor in the rate base section. On December 15, 2023, Consumers Energy filed an application with the commission to increase its rates for distribution of natural gas and other relief. The rate increase thought in this proceeding is based on the company's projections for investment expenses and revenue for a 12 month period or the test year ending September 30th, 2025. Consumers Energy original application requested a $136 million <clears throat> base rate increase that was later reduced to $113 million by the company. The company requested a rate on common, a return on common equity of 10.25% with an overall rate of return on total rate base of 6.2% and a 51.5 <clears throat> 51 common equity ratio. The, com the company explained in its application that additional revenues are necessary to afford the company a reasonable opportunity to recover its reasonable cost of providing natural gas service. Intervention in the case was granted to multiple parties, including commission staff, the attorney general, the Association of Business Advocating Tariff Equity, Retail Energy Supply Association, Lansing Board of Water and Light, Michigan State University, Citizens Utility Board of Michigan and Energy Michigan. The record consists of 2,058 pages of transcript and 324 exhibits received into evidence. Subsequently, on July 12, 2024, the parties filed a settlement agreement resolving all issues in the case. The settlement agreement provides guidance in a number of areas, and a few are highlighted here. Uh, Consumers Energy sold its un regulated home energy products program to an unaffiliated third-party buyer for an upfront gain of $110 million. The parties agree that Consumers Energy shall share 100% of the net upfront gain with customers. $27.5 million will be used as an offset to revenue deficiency in the upcoming test year, and the remaining $82.5 million will be credited back to customers over a three-year period. The Enhanced Infrastructure Replacement Program, EIRP, shall have a spend amount of $215.3 million for the 12 months ending September 30th, 2025. The company will continue to file its annual EIRP planning and performance reports. In its next gas rate case filing, Consumers Energy will provide a cost of service study version that shows a more granular allocation of other distribution plant and the impact of utilizing the average and excess allocation. Also in its next gas rate case filing, Consumers Energy will undertake two studies with the participation and input of interested parties. The first, the first study will examine the break-even points and bringing the break-even points and the customer charges closer to cost of service. The second study will provide a more detailed analysis of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission FERC account 378 regarding station equipment. Consumers Energy is authorized to implement a pension and other post-employment benefits, OPEB, volatility mechanism that authorizes the company to compare actual pension and OPEB expense to amounts included in rates. With any difference recorded as a regulatory asset or regulatory liability for future recovery from or credit to customers and would be amortized over 10 years starting the following January. The parties agree that new rates will be effective October 1st, 2024. The order before you approves a settlement agreement that adopts an October 1st, 2024 through September 30th, 2025 test year, an authorized rate of return on common equity of 9.9% and a common equity ratio of 50%. Consumers Energy is authorized to implement rates that increase its annual retail natural gas revenues by approximately $35 million 
over the rates approved in the July 13th, 2023 order in case U21308. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witt. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21490. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? Oh, yep, yeah, I, I only have a couple of comments uh, I'd like to make sure as Mr. Witt already did an excellent job summarizing uh, the highlights of this order. Um, so first, I want to thank all the interveners in this case, including our MPSC staff, the Attorney General, and the numerous organizations who contributed their expertise and collaborated towards the resolutions presented in the settlement agreement. Second, I'd like to underscore the importance of a few developments resulting from this settlement that are designed to engage interested parties and strengthen data availability while providing transparency into consumers' decision-making approaches. These developments include the agreement for consumers to undertake the two studies uh, Mr. Witt referenced, the first study examining the break-even points and bringing the break-even points and customer charges closer to cost of service, and the second study to provide a more detailed analysis of FERC account 378. Another development is the requirement to hold an annual technical conference starting in January 2025 uh, for interested parties that will provide the engineering basis and support for the plastic and steel pipe projects selected in the Enhanced Infrastructure Replacement uh, Program Planning Report, um, including any other decision criteria used by the company to determine the plan for that calendar year. And so I would like to encourage those interested in participating and providing input into these studies or the annual conference to engage as ABLE, as these are opportunities not only to receive more insight on the company's performance reports or, or cost of service, but they also help inform future prioritization of investment in our energy infrastructure. And these studies and the conference are all examples of important ways our utilities can keep the public or interested parties involved and informed on the data and technical details of key infrastructure proposals. Thank you, Commissioner Kerryon. Is there any additional discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21490 is approved. Recognize Ms. Day. Item 4B2 is case number U21629, which involves an application filed by Consumers Energy Company for ex parte approval to construct and operate the proposed O305 well line, which consists of a new six inch natural gas pipeline in the Oversea, oh, I'm sorry, Overisel storage field in Allegan County. The order before you approves the application and makes the required agency findings regarding the project's environmental impact. Thank you, Ms. Day. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21629. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21629 is approved. And for the last time today, I recognize Ms. Day. Item 4B3 is case number U-21656, which involves an ex parte application filed by Consumers Energy Company for approval to utilize a regulatory asset to defer the loss associated with the potential sale of the company's Riverside storage field. The order before you approves the application. I move for the approval of the order in case number U-21656. I second the motion. Is there any discussion? We will now have a vote on the motion to approve the order. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The order in case number U-21656 is approved. We've now reached the time reserved for members of the public to address the commission. As mentioned in the notice for today's meeting, we will take public comments in the following order. First from individuals attending in person and then from individuals participating remotely, either through Microsoft Teams or the phone who have entered the speaker queue. As a reminder, this public comment period is for commissioners to listen to comments and concerns and not to answer specific questions. When providing comment, please indicate your name and where you live if you are willing to share so that we have it for our records. And again, please limit comments to one per person and keep them brief, no longer than three minutes, so we have a chance to hear from all who would like to comment. We do have a couple of comment cards, three, uh, in fact. Um, and so we'll start with those and then uh, we'll go to the, the virtual options. Um, the first is Val. Wolshied Brennan, I think I got it. So excellent. Uh, and then Carol Sanborn. Nice to see you again. <laughs> uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, thank you uh, for letting me speak again today. My name is Vale Wolshied Brennan. I'm here once again today regarding ITC's Nelson to Oneida Road 345 KV transmission project, case U21471. 
Um, first, I'd like to thank the Commission for updating their website with an extensive Q&A surrounding transmission line siting um, and providing this information to the public. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, on to the real business. June, on June 28th, FERC approved METSI's application for an abandoned plant incentive rate. However, it was not without strong criticism from FERC Commissioner Mark Christie, whom dissented from the order granting METSI's request. I'd like to read you some quotes from Commissioner Christie. The abandoned plant incentive rate is nothing more than a transfer of wealth from consumers to transmission developers and risk from developers to consumers. It is long past time for the commission to revisit its check the box practice. The longer the commission does nothing to address these unfair transfers of wealth, the more consumers are exploited. The regional transmission planning process is not remotely the equivalent of a serious litigated state certificate of public convenience and necessity. FERC's policy of ignoring whether the state CPCN proceeding took place before granting incentives is one of the central issues that must be reconsidered. As a former state regulator, I know firsthand how important it is to conduct credible state CPCN proceedings that evaluate the need and cost of a proposed of a proposed project. It is especially timely now in light of a recent federal and district court decision. In my time as commissioner, there has been anything other than a cursory analysis with the barest mentions of the specifics of the transmission projects. Every transmission developer um, seems to cite the same reasons for the same incentives. The commission's incentive policies effectively make the consumers the bank and the insurer, while the return on equity adder is an involuntary gift from consumers. There has been and continues to be something really wrong with this picture. This continuing failure to protect consumers was one of the pillars of my dissent. These comments that I've quoted from Commissioner Christie highlight the fundamental problems at the federal level and stress how important it is for the Michigan Public Service Commission to protect consumers and landowners and not reward projects just because they are regionally cost shared. I'd like to remind the MPSC that your team is the only line of defense that my family has to protect us against eternal damage to our livelihoods, all three of our family homes and properties, our historical centennial farm, and multi-generational investments, all of which can never be replaced. We are enduring severe stress and emotional damage while spending our life savings, retirements, and kids' college funds to intervene at the MPSC level because our many attempts to resolve concerns with ITC are ignored or denied. This is deeply unfair, and we will never receive compensation for our damages while ITC gets reimbursed 100%. The hundreds of Michiganders affected by this project should not be unnecessarily damaged by a for-profit company trying to avoid future reliability upgrades and the cost of replacing facilities due to age and condition. Thank you for your time and letting me speak again today. Thank you. Uh, Carol Sanborn is next and then Robert Williams. Ms. Sanborn, nice to see you again. Hi, Carol Sanborn. I live in North Pilamo by the Maple River on Hubbardston Road. Um, I'm also talking about this U21471 Nelson Road to Oneida project. And today, I just wanted to try to play um, a short video that my son sent me. <clears throat> he was by Rose, Rose City near a 345 kilovolt line. And I'll just play it so you can hear it. And I'll, I'll put it on the loudest I can. And it also looked like it affected the video quality. And that has long been a worry of mine too. 
and he could hear that up to 700 feet away too. And he has a range finder, so he knows how far it actually was. Um, I worry about that affecting our home. Like if I can work from home anymore, if it's gonna affect our TVs or our radio reception, any of that stuff. So that's all I wanted to do was play that little clip. To me, it sounds like a frying pan constantly. I don't like it. I'm afraid of what it'll do to my mental health and my physical health. So that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you, Ms. Sanborn. And Robert Williams. Good morning again. My name is Robert Williams, and this is regarding case 21472, the ITC Holdings Helix to Hippo portion of the transmission line project. I am the owner and manager of 18MI, which is a federally registered airport just south of Marshall. And it is set up, it'll be an air park where we'll have, right now there are two houses, up to five houses with hangars and aircraft, um, generating income to the state and local tax revenue for you know, long past when we're all gone for decades. Um, <clears throat> I talked to a Hanya, Tanya Harding on March 20th, sent her a letter, she reviewed it. We actually talked on the telephone. She is a senior permit specialist for ITC Holdings. She turned that over to the planning department, and as of March 21st, I have heard nothing from anything from the planning department from the ITC Holdings. Um, I, pro I spoke at a previous meetings, and if they go online to the public comment now, everything is shown. I have some documentary. I am on the proposed route. Um, there is an option I came up with, which I'm sure they've never even looked at, just to move it slightly on the proposed route, uh, slightly shorter than what they have proposed and that would completely eliminate any problems I have. What they want to do is run right across the middle of the runway, which would close the airport. It runs within approximately 150 feet of the house on my property. And as the second commenter made, I used to live within probably half a mile of some old tension lines, hot, humid night. Oh yeah, you can see the power coming off, you can hear it. Uh, you can have, we were younger, we used to take light bulbs out and they would light up on, on the ground when you held them up in the air, fluorescent tubes. So. I am looking at for someone either here or someone that's watching online from ITC Holdings, please go ahead and look at what the public filings are, what I have online there. I have hard copies if there's someone here to show you. Um, you know, I say at this point, they've never even reached out to me and knowing what they're gonna do. So if they do run it, it will actually close the airport, which the residuals, or excuse me, a residue for myself um, and the future for the state and local township tax-wise. Uh, I am a flight instructor. That's my sole source of income, and I use this field extensively for training students. So if there's any questions, they may, I'll be here after the meeting if they'd like to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Do we have anybody else uh, who would like to make public comment in person before we move to the virtual options? I know that we have at least one person uh, participating through the virtual options who would like to make public comment, and so Heidi Drumhiller, you can unmute mute your Teams feed. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, looks like it's working. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you very much. Um, I am I am experiencing some of the uh, same frustration as the previous speaker. Um, we have tried to reach ITC and uh, Burns and McDonald without any progress. Sometimes ITC will take months to answer a phone call. So I appreciate the forum here to be able to speak with you. Um, I have read filings, uh, 560 pages of filings. There is not one mention about um, the uh, habitat for the Eastern Masasaki rattlesnake that habitats our property. I am, um, I am talking about case U-21472, the Helix Hippo uh, transmission line, and my property is at 4601 18 and a half mile road. We have a 25 acre marsh, and uh, it is the habitat of this rattlesnake that is federally protected and considered um, threatened and it has been, it has taken a dangerous decline. 
So I have actually sent proof of this rattlesnake with pictures to ITC and Burns and McDonald's with no response. I have read the IPAC, which is the information for planning and consulting put out by the U.S. Fisheries Division of the DNR, and it states that you are required to determine if your project has effects on the threatened species. So I have contacted both agencies and said, please come out and actually inspect this property, walk through so you can see it. Uh, so far, absolutely nothing. And I did send them pictures. I really feel that the emails and calls are just being heard with deaf ears. I don't think it's being forwarded to the MPSC. Um, as a review of the data collected by Burns and McDonald as a part of the route study, it does not mention the Eastern Masasaki rattlesnake or the letter that the Michigan Department of DNR wrote them in January of 2023. The Endangered Species Act protects this snake that is in our marsh. It is their habitat and we have photographed proof. It should be classified as a tier one or tier two area. Um, the DNR and IPAC states you should not cite a project so it overlaps in every, any tier one or tier two habitat of any federally endangered species. So I talked with Matthew Dana of the Plainwell Fisheries and, Bio, and, uh, and he's a biologist there with the uh, Michigan Department of DNR. And he actually wrote Burns and McDonald in January of 2023. And he wrote the Eastern Masasaka rattlesnake should be a priority of avoidance and its habitat. I called him yesterday. We spoke in depth. He is advising and will advise avoiding our marsh due to the presence of the snake. Our marsh is a, a pretty small on our property. It's only 20, 25 acres, more or less. Um, this can easily be avoided by moving the line just slightly to the west. We are also the home of the monarch butterfly, um, and the marsh just this last week was full of milkweed blooms, and we had hundreds and hundreds of the protected monarchs in this marsh. Um, I'm going to explain to you um, how the creeks in our air, in our marsh work. We have two. We have a 23-acre marsh. We have we have two creeks that run horizontal, and then we have um, a vertical creek. So the bottom creek, and I I oh, can never pronounce this. Natapuasi Creek, it runs to the south. And then um, there is the Natawa drain that comes up kind of vertical and then takes a turn. So we are kind of um, landlocked by these creeks um, and there's no room for a transmission line. The drain commissioner in Calhoun County, Mr. Smith, I talked to him earlier this year. He said he has a 200 foot um, easement on all of those creeks and he will not allow encroachment on that um, unless it's, it's completely over top of it. And it's too long of a stretch not to have holes in that area. Also listed on their own generated maps, uh, Burns and McDonald classified our area as completely a wetland. And any disruption out there will actually flood this entire area, all this farmland. It's a very important piece of property. I hope somebody can come out and take a look at it. Um, and I think uh, that is exactly what I wanted to say today. So again, I appreciate the opportunity and I hope that this snake is taken into consideration. Thank you very much, Ms. Drumheller. Thank you. I think that that uh, is all the folks who have signaled an interest um, in providing public comment today. So we will conclude the public comment period of the meeting. Uh, please note that the public may continue to uh, submit comments to the commissioners at any time via email at lara-mpsc-commissioners2 at michigan.gov. And again, that is that email address is in the, the meeting notice um, for today's meeting as well. Um, before we wrap up, I have uh, four announcements. Um, the first is that the commission will hold a public hearing in Marquette next Tuesday, July 30th to hear from the public about a study on Upper Peninsula energy issues as directed by the legislature. Uh, all three commissioners and a number of our staff will be on hand from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Northern Michigan University Northern Central Ballroom 2, uh, which is located at 1401 Presqu'ile Avenue in Marquette. And uh, we're looking forward to, to meeting with and hearing the, the perspectives of Upper Peninsula residents. 
Second, next month on Wednesday, August 28th, we will have a public hearing in Flint, uh, also from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Riverfront Conference Center on the campus of the University of Michigan Flint. That's located at one Riverfront Plaza in Flint. Uh, and this is related to uh, case number U-21638, which we opened at May in May pursuant to the energy reforms adopted by the legislature last year. Uh, to consider options to expand opportunities for public engagement in the Commission's decision-making processes and procedures. Uh, and look forward to, to hearing from individuals there as well. Uh, my third uh, comment today is to, or announcement, is to congratulate uh, Commissioner Peritic, who has been named one of 10 commissioners from across the country and one of two from the Midwest region. Uh, to the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners new Federal and State Current Issues Collaborative in partnership with the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, uh, Commission, or FERC. Um, the collaborative is designed to provide a venue for federal and state regulators to share perspectives, improve understanding, and where appropriate, identify potential solutions regarding challenges and coordination on matters that affect specific state and federal regulatory jurisdictions with potential topics to include exploring where best to coordinate between state and federal regulators on issues ranging from electric reliability and resource adequacy to natural gas electric coordination, wholesale and retail markets, new technologies and innovations and infrastructure. So congratulations on being named to that new collaborative. And then finally, I would uh, invite former Commissioner Bob Nelson to come forward if he is so willing. Always fun to embarrass our commissioners emeritus. Commissioner Nelson was appointed, you can have a seat there in either one, uh, appointed by Governor Engler in May 1999 to the commission and reappointed in August of that year. He served with distinction as a member of the Public Service Commission representing independents uh, through July 2nd, 2025, or 2005, sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to keep you here that long. <laughs> uh, he's also had a rich post-commission career, including perhaps most notably helping to form the Citizens Utility Board uh, of Michigan, or CUB as it's often known, and serving on its board of directors until stepping down earlier this year as he pursues retirement full time. Both at the MPSC and with CUB, uh, Commissioner Nelson it has been universally regarded for his thoughtfulness, his kindness, his regulatory expertise, and his passion for the interests of utility customers. Uh, what folks may not know, though, is that he's also well known internally, at least, as the informal bard of the commission, <laughs> helping to uh, initiate a tradition of commissioner karaoke where we take popular songs and rewrite them with energy and telecommunications themes. Yes, we really are that nerdy here. Uh, that has led to such favorites as the Eagles' Take It Easy, uh, being uh, repurposed by former Commissioner Norm Sari as Taken Evie. Uh, George Strait's classic Amarillo by Morning uh, to bid former Chair Sally Talberg goodbye with ERCOT board by morning and with great offense to Prince, uh, redoing Purple Rain as Purple Rain. Um, it's a tradition that carries on to this day and started by Commissioner Nelson. So as you prepare to step into retirement, I wanna congratulate you on your many contributions, both in the orders and work of the commission, and perhaps even more importantly, to the culture of the commission and to Cub and the organizations that you've been a part of. Um, while you were all about those rates, those rates and tariffs, to perhaps paraphrase Mer Megan Trainer's classic, as a commissioner, you showed us that uh, according to the Beatles, all you need is love or perhaps all you need is cub in your retirement years. <laughs> and maybe to start with the opening lines of those, there's nothing you can do Bob hasn't done. He told us, he taught us all to sing and then we sung. And perhaps that's the greatest tribute of all. So congratulations and good luck in your next chapter. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this very much appreciated recognition. I, one of my first songs was Danny Be Good uh, to the retiring commissioner, Dan Demlo. And so uh, it started with, with Danny Be Good, and we've, we've had many songs after that, including the ones that you've mentioned. But I, I appreciate the recognition very much. Um, I, I've known 30 commissioners over my time. Uh, and 13 chairmen. 
Uh, and the only person that's been here longer than me is, Dan, is Paul Proudfoot in the back. There. <laughs> so. That's true of all of us. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, I'll keep Danny be good in, in mind as we go about our work from here. So congratulations yes. again. Uh, the next regular commission meeting is scheduled for Thursday, August 22nd at 1 o'clock p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn today's meeting. I second the motion. We will now have a vote on the motion to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries by a unanimous vote. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody.